well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this May First Friday webinar. Um, we're very excited to have Mason Margada from the University of British Columbia presenting with us, um, presenting his presentation uh, titled Let's Get Passive. Um, just before I pass it over to Mason, though, I have a couple quick notes. Just so everyone's aware, uh, we are recording today's presentation so that it can be uploaded to YouTube later on for those who are unable to attend today. Um, so with that being said, I believe there's going to be participation opportunities. Feel free to participate. We hope that this is a comfortable environment for everyone to par uh, participate. That can be through the chat, through turning on your microphone when, uh, when possible and when asked to and that sort of thing. But as well, remember to keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Um, also, before you log off later on today, uh, don't forget to fill out our first Friday webinar evaluation, which I'll give access to via a link in the chat near the end of the presentation. We're also always looking for new presenters for the first Friday webinar series, so feel free to fill out the form and include your email at the bottom uh, and we'll reach out to you for interest or you can reach out to the Pro uh, professional development committee um, via the email which I'll also be posting in the chat. Um, but without further ado, I will pass it over to Mason. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you this morning. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Mason. I am so excited to be presenting with you today. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here so that we can jump right into the presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking today about passives. We're going to be getting a little bit passive today, which I feel like in our 2020-2021 uh, school years was something that we were thinking about more is how do we engage with our students without being in a physical activity space together. Um, before I get started though, I do want to have a land acknowledgement and so I am presenting today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkamunan speaking Musqueam people. I also want to acknowledge that you are likely joining from many different places and maybe on other territory or land of Indigenous people. Uh, it's important for me to do this land acknowledgement and also acknowledge my positionality as a settler on this land and my um, great honor it is to be able to learn and to live in a place um, that is unceded territory of Musqueam people. Um, and so it's exciting for us to be here together in this virtual space, but I do encourage you to do some reflecting on where are you joining from um, and whose land that is that you are joining from and uh, how grateful we are to be able to have this opportunity to, to be together to learn um, on this land that is Indigenous people's lands. So who am I? Uh, my name is Mason Margada, as I said. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am a residence life manager here at UBC, um, which is the University of British Columbia on the Vancouver campus. Uh, I've been active in Northwest Okuho for about four years now, um, and my biggest hobby is playing lots and lots and lots of board games, um, and I, I love it, so please don't ask me questions about board games during the presentation, because I will completely stop talking about what I'm supposed to be talking about and talk about board games instead. Um, so if you want to get me sidetracked, totally, that's great. Put board game questions in the chat box, but um, let's try to get through the presentation first and maybe we can stay a little bit afterwards and talk about that. Um, I would really love it if you could just put in the chat your name, uh, your pronouns, and what institution you're working on. And if you'd like to share a hobby that you have, uh, maybe one that's new since COVID started, or maybe something that you've been doing for a long time, um, it would be great to, to see those in the chat and to just get to know you all a little bit better. Um, and then I'll pull up the chat box and, and to, to say hello to everyone. Um, we have a relatively small group today, so I feel like it's nice. Um, hi, Ben. It's nice to meet you from OSU. That's great. Love the board games. Okay, we can definitely stay late and uh, compare board game lists. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks, Chris, from MRU. Lots of online games this year. Yes, yes. Awesome. Thanks, Kelsey, from Willamette. And Tess, nice to meet you, Tess and Jen. Hi, hi. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. It's so great to meet all of you and to see all of your wonderful hobbies. And I'm so glad that you all are here joining me today. Um, so as we get through our presentation, today we're going to be learning a little bit about how UBC has increased our capacity 
for passive curricular programming in residence this year especially. Uh, we'll also be engaging with various approaches to delivering educational content. And then finally, we'll be doing some practice and creating a passive campaign that meets a learning objective. So there will be some time for some breakout room activity at the end, um, which should be a lot of fun. Um, and before then, we'll be going through some of the things that we found successful at UBC and some ways that we've tried to be creative in, in our approach to how we do passive programming. For a bit of context, UBC decided this year that we were going to implement a first year curricula. So this is something that had been worked on for years up until the 2020 school year. Um, and so when COVID hit, we had to really think about what does this mean for our implementation? Do we want to wait another year or do we want to just push ahead because we have it ready to go and we want to do it? And so the goal of creating an intentional scaffolded learning outcomes for first year residents still seemed like an important goal to have. It still seemed like something that we wanted to try to accomplish for our students coming in, even if that student body was going to be a bit smaller than it normally was. And so after many discussions and hard conversations, we decided to go ahead and move forward with it in September 2020 and launch our residential curriculum. Adjustments, of course, had to be made, which is a thing that does happens with any kind of launch of a new program. Uh, and the majority of our deliverables for this past school year moved to either online delivery or passive delivery. So the way that we were implementing those first year learning objectives was completely different than what we had expected because we weren't able to get everybody into the same room to be doing uh, hands-on activities, to have that experiential learning in the same way. And so we had to be really creative and thinking about how are we still trying to hit these learning outcomes um, and to determine whether or not we actually did hit those learning outcomes we also had to make sure that we were doing the assessment needed to make sure we had a good idea of those learning outcomes success and how much our students were taking away from our new implementation. And so for us, we decided that there were a few key touch points that needed to happen throughout the year in order to make our assessment successful. Uh, the first was within the first four weeks. So in September, um, we reached out to students to have them fill out a survey. Um, all of our first year students um, received that survey and we had actually really high uptake, about 80% of our students actually filled back in that survey, um, which I think I attribute to that like sep September first year, very excited to be there, don't know that they can just not listen to our emails from here on out um, yet. And so we had really high uptake on that first survey, which was great because we were able to get some really good assessment data. And then at the end of term one uh, in December, we think was another uh, key point. And then before the end of their first year in April, we actually just finished up our last piece of assessment with a survey that we sent around to folks. And so we'll be going over that data in the next coming weeks. Um, and so we're excited to see how our curriculum has allowed us to scaffold that knowledge and to see where we've been able to to build upon throughout the year the ideas that we've, we've wanted to give to our first year students as they go into their upper years at university. And so we've implemented this curriculum at UBC, we're ready to go, um, but how do we get the knowledge out to the students? That was the main question for us. And a lot of the time we ended up landing on what we considered passive programming. And so these passive programmings are things like posters that we have always said in residence life is like, you have to have an active component and a passive component so people can come to it when they want. Um, but postering was not necessarily going to be the most successful way that we were going to do all of our programming this year. And so we really wanted to think, how can people come to something on their own terms in their own time asynchronously using the key phrase that we've all learned in the last two years uh, to be able to engage with that content and to be able to uh, take something away. So the first thing that we did um, at UBC, we have a really strong commitment to sustainability. And so we wanted to be able to provide first year students coming from all over the world with the knowledge that was going to help them be successful with recycling on our campus, uh, knowing that our recycling systems may be different from those of students coming from uh, international uh, different countries and from different places in the world. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that they felt really confident in what they were recycling, where they were recycling those things, and how recycling works at UBC, um, and all of the great work that UBC does in having our own recycling sorting facilities and having our own composting facilities here on campus. And so we wanted to make sure that all of that good information was getting out to students. Historically, we've been able to partner with sustainability teams on campus to have volunteers 
in dining halls, helping people sort food and uh, waste. And that's always been a really positive experience for our student leaders to be able to have that partnership with the sustainability team on campus. Um, but this year that team was discontinued for the year um, because of COVID. And so there were no volunteers for us to, to bring into our dining halls, which makes sense. And so we were rethinking like, how do we have that engagement and have that kind of personal touch that we really found was important with those volunteers, um, but in a way that was not going to be uh, necessary to have people physically in the dining hall helping people and talking to people and uh, we were able to work with a company to put together a talking sorting station and so we had these uh, speech bubbles pasted above all of our sorting stations in the dining halls and all of our waste recycling stations in all of the halls um, all of the floors in our buildings and so whenever anybody went to go recycle they would have a thing that said hello sorting station with a big speech bubble that says, please talk to me. And it had a QR code on it and you could scan the QR code and it would send a text message from your phone saying, hello sorting station to the number provided there. Uh, if you do wanna give it a try, uh, I uh, am not legally responsible for any foreign, uh, <laughs> any long distance charges that may apply. Please send a text message at your own risk. But if you are within the BC area um, or feel like you want to send a text message, you can try texting Hello Sorting Station to 604-359-5979. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it just has a couple of responses and it walks you through a basic conversation where it will share a couple of fun facts about recycling at UBC um, and some statistics about how our um, waste sorting and sustainability initiatives on campus work which is a lot of fun for students. And so it's really, really great to, to have that kind of personal touch where somebody feels like they're actually talking to, to something um, and to have that still engagement in being able to have not just a poster explaining these things, but to have something that they can actively do, uh, which we, we really found was successful. And we've had a good uptake in this, especially at the beginning of the year. Um, it of course like tapered off, but it was really a, a thing that we wanted to make sure that students have right from the beginning and were able to get. And so um, it was an exciting opportunity for us to be able to have this way to engage with students where we didn't have to be actively um, participating in it all of the time and have those volunteers um, giving their time in order to, to be talking to the students. And so um, this was a really fun and creative way for us to, to be able to still hit those metrics of teaching people about sustainability at UBC but in a way that was going to be engaging for them. Um, one of the ways that we really tried to um, tease through whether or not people were going to do it is by being very vague with our, our posters and just saying like, hello, text me, this is so fun. Um, and so they didn't really know what they were going to get when they texted the sorting station, which was great. Um, and so then they were like, oh, this is all about sustainability facts. It's a lot of fun. So it's a it's a very fun thing to do. And, and if anybody is interested, you can reach out to me and I can set, um, connect you with a company that we used in order to make this happen. Um, it is something that took a lot of work over the summer because we had to go through a lot of conversation trees and a lot of testing. Um, the early versions of it were a little weird to talk to. Um, so there was a lot of uh, back and forth with trying to figure out what exactly we wanted the things to say, but it was a lot of fun to put together. One of our other learning objectives beyond sustainability um, is our land acknowledgement and reconciliation and indigenous learning at UBC. And so the next learning objective that we really focused on was our um, knowledge around the land acknowledgement, which is for our first year students, kind of the first introduction to all of the work that UBC is doing in reconciliation and trying to decolonize the way that we do our, our work and our learning here at this university. And so we're really focusing on the land acknowledgement to give a solid foundation for our first year students. Um, as you heard in the land acknowledgement that I did in this presentation, uh, there were three adjectives that I used in the land acknowledgement that are um, very important and are things that traditional ancestral or likely words that students have heard before, but unseated is maybe a word that students haven't learned before. And so we really wanted to make sure that they knew the actual definitions of traditional, ancestral, and unseated. Um, that's part of our curriculum and is one of the things that on their very first day at UBC at the pep rally, they will hear this land acknowledgement and that might be the first time they've heard a land acknowledgement in their life. Um, and so it's really important for them to know what it is a land acknowledgement does and why we do 
do those land acknowledgements and, and the um, importance behind those. The other reason that we really focus on this in residence is that we are bringing people onto the land. The whole purpose of residence life is to have people living here in this physical place. And so for us, it's very important to recognize our own responsibility in that. We are the people that are welcoming people to this campus, um, even though we are not stewards of this land. And so really we're not able to welcome people to this land. And so making sure that our students are aware of the place that they are now living, um, especially if they have never been to North America before and have not experienced um, what reconciliation in Canada looks like and what these um, land acknowledgements might mean for being in a physical place. And so for this, we did go the poster route because we wanted to make sure that there was going to be something large that people could spend time thinking about and, and just trying to parse out what these adjectives actually mean. And so the poster that we've created um, here at UBC, you know, this picture was messed up the last time I presented it and now it's messed up again. I thought I fixed it and I didn't and that's okay. We're gonna move right along. This is the poster recreated for the land acknowledgements at UBC. It has our land acknowledgement there. The University of British Columbia is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. This is the start to all of the land acknowledgements at UBC and it's something that's important for people to recognize because they will hear it over and over again as a university career goes on. Um, and we want them to engage with it critically, even after the, the first, second, third time that they've heard it. And so we break down those three adjectives, um, saying that traditional recognizes lands traditionally used and or occupied by the Musqueam people or other First Nations in other parts of the country. Uh, ancestral recognizes land that is handed down from generation to gen uh, generation. And then unceded refers to land that was not turned over to the Crown government by treaty or other agreement. And so for us here at UBC and in the Lower Mainland, the majority of indigenous lands in BC are unceded territories. And so it was important for us to recognize that even for other Canadians that are coming from other parts of Canada that may be living on treaty land or um, treaty territory. And so they don't necessarily know that history in BC about how our land is unceded. Um, just letting people know that it's important to recognize Musqueam territory in a relationship with Musqueam people. And this doesn't just appear as a formality. So we don't want people to just tune out every time a land acknowledgement happens. We want them to actively engage with what these words actually mean. The QR codes on this poster, there are two. Uh, the one in the lower right-hand corner um, leads to the page about these three adjectives and allows people to go further in engaging critically with what these words actually mean um, and to learn a little bit more about how the land acknowledgement was created at UBC, um, how we've worked with Musqueam to um, put together this land acknowledgement and make sure that it is uh, accomplishing what the Musqueam people want from a land acknowledgement. Um, and then on the left hand side, you'll see the reconciliation poll at UBC. Um, the reason that we decided to include this uh, picture of the reconciliation poll is because it is actually right outside of our first year residence. And so uh, a lot of our students can actually see this reconciliation poll from their bedroom. And so they may have no idea what it actually means on campus, what they may have moved in and saw it and said, that looks so cool, I wonder what that is. Um, and so we put it on this poster because we want to make sure that we're connecting um, the history and the place of where they are and to, to pull a landmark that they most definitely have walked by already, even as they move into residence, um, to the idea of reconciliation, to the idea of land acknowledgements and being on Indigenous land. And so that second QR code goes to information about the reconciliation poll specifically. Um, and we really encourage our first year students as they get here in September to go um, and engage with all the different ways that we've created learning opportunities across campus. And so we've put together scavenger hunts where they can go on um, house poll tours across our campus. And so um, this is a really important way for people to engage, but this is kind of the first step in that. And that's why we've created this passive is to, to make sure that they have that strong foundation to have an acknowledgement of the land.
I'm just gonna take one moment to just check the chat and see if there's any questions or anything. I don't see any, that's great. If you do have a question, I am happy to answer those at any time. I know that I've just been blurting words at you this entire time and it is a lot of talking, um, but we will have some engagement soon. Um, the final passive that we put together that I wanna highlight today for, for you all is the uh, Beyond the Plate recipe competition, which actually wrapped up this spring um and this was something that we we came to because one of the things that we acknowledged and identified in first year residents is that experience of eating in the dining hall and having meals together is so critically important to building community and to, to creating that sense of belonging and so we wanted to figure out a way to be able to share a meal but without being able to sit in the same place and eat together. And so we got to work thinking about what this could be and what this could mean. And so in collaboration with our counselors and residents, which are um, two counselors that work in uh, conjunction with counseling services to provide service, uh, counseling services specifically to just residents, and they have their offices in residence buildings, which is really exciting. Um, and so working with them and our nutritionist in residence, who's um, usually here to run in-person programs in the dining halls about nutrition and wellness, um, and generally uh, is around our dining halls a lot during the year. And so um, we wanted to engage with both our counselors and our nutritionists to, to bring together a program that was still going to be critically engaging for our students and to, to teach them about wellness and nutrition um, without being able to kind of stand over them while they eat, because <laughs> um, that's not allowed right now. Um, so we've created a new recipe competition to engage students. So this recipe competition was a short video. Um, really, we were a bit inspired by TikTok recipes. I don't know about you all, but TikTok recipes are very exciting for me. I've cooked a lot of TikTok food. Um, TikTok pasta is fantastic if you haven't tried it yet. Uh, and so we were thinking about these short one to two minute videos for recipes and we wanted to have the recipes be plant-based and we gave resources around um, how to create plant-based recipes as well as having uh, recipes that are accessible to everyone because not all of our students have kitchens. Our first year residents don't have any access to kitchen space. And so how are we doing a recipe competition in a way that's going to be helpful and critically engaging for students that aren't actually living with a kitchen and cooking for themselves. And so this is a, an exciting way for us to engage with them. And we did have actually quite good uptake. Um, we had about 35 videos submitted, which we thought was a pretty good uptake for something that was so high entry level as uh, creating a video yourselves. Um, we whittled it down to five finalists. Um, and then at the end, we had um, one finalist or one winner and two runners up. Um, the winner actually is going to get their recipe implemented in our dining halls next year. And so they get to work with our chef on campus to put together that recipe in a way that's going to be able to be served in the dining hall um, and be added to the menu full time here at UBC, which is really exciting. Um, and they also got a bevy of prizes from cookbooks to uh, gift cards to local grocery stores uh, to a subscription to an app that delivers plants, which is a really cool thing that our nutritionist found. So um, there was a really great uptick in um, just engagement around nutrition. And we were really excited to see all the creativity that students put together in the recipes. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, which actually has our explanation video. And so this is the video that we put out to people kind of showing them like what this could look like. Um, one thing that I wanna say before I show this video to you all is that the kind of really exciting piece of it is that the students were able to use a software that is a free software for UBC students to do video editing. And so that was another resource we were able to provide to people is a way for them to do video editing on their own, which is really, really great. Um, I'm just gonna quickly stop share for just one moment so that I can just double check that when I hit screen share last time, I said optimize for video and I did. So we're good to go. All right. Hi everyone, happy new year and welcome back to our second term of the 2020 winter school year. I'm just here to tell you about the Beyond the Plate competition that we'll be hosting in residence in the next upcoming month. As part of this competition, we want to hear about some of your favorite plant-based recipes. To enter, you just need to submit a video that's ideally less than two minutes in length that students can follow along and use as a reference for a plant-based, so no animal or meat products, recipe. 
These recipes should be student friendly, so we're looking for quick, simple, easy to prepare recipes that don't cost a whole lot to make. Videos can be submitted by Qualtrics, and the deadline to submit is February 24th, 2021, which is the Wednesday just after reading break. An example of a recipe you can include might be one for overnight oats, where you would talk about the ingredients required in their amounts, such as half a cup of oats, a third of a cup of soy milk, one banana, and a tablespoon of chia seeds. Then, you would describe the preparation method of the recipe while either filming yourself making the recipe, or by providing an animation. In this case, just place all ingredients in a mason jar and refrigerate overnight. Just a reminder that the deadline to submit is Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. We've got multiple prizes for multiple winners this year, with a total prize money worth $1,000, so we encourage you all to submit and share. Select videos make it a special shout out on UBC Foodies' social media channels. And lastly, when submitting, we encourage you all to include closed captions for reviewers if possible. So fun, amazing. Oh, that was so great. Um, so we were really excited about that video. Um, Hi everyone, happy to be here. We um, and we had one of our residence advisors create the video themselves. And so um, it was a really awesome opportunity for students to be able to show the, off their creativity and to connect with each other. Um, we're going to be sharing all of the um, finalists videos over our social media as the summer goes on um, and be sharing those recipes with people and so we're really excited to to be, have been able to connect people with a with food which we think is such an important connector for folks um, but in a way that was going to be engaging and safe in COVID times which was really great so um, yeah we were really excited about that when we thought that it was really um, a creative solution to, to that um, thinking about how do we connect people through food like we normally would without being able to have like free pizza parties for all. So I have now spoken quite a lot about all of the things that we've done at UBC, but I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to share your ideas. Um, and so we're gonna do a bit of a design competition. Um, so I'll put you into teams of maybe two or three because our group is a little small um, and we'll have 15 minutes to create a passive. I'll be putting you into breakout rooms in just a moment. I've set it up so that you all can screen share. So feel free to use tools like Canva together if you want. Um, I've also provided a Jamboard, which I will um, put in the chat box in just a moment. Um, and after 15 minutes, we'll come back and everyone can present on uh, their design and what they wanna do. And so what are you designing to? What is the learning outcome that we want? So great question. Uh, the prompt that I want you to think about is your learning outcome is how to manage a budget, specifically how to budget for food when starting to cook for yourself for the first time. And so that is the learning outcome that you want for students is learning about how to budget for food and cooking for yourself for the first time. What does that look like for your student body? So you can think about for your university, um, this is likely going to be a program for first year students as they transition either out of your residence halls for upper year or into upper year residence in your university that has kitchens. Um, and so thinking about how are we teaching our students how to manage their budget and, and be able to cook for themselves. And you want to come up with a passive program. Um, it could be something like a competition like we've shown or a poster or uh, another creative way to engage with people. Um, it just has to be asynchronous so that students can come to it in their own time. Um, that's the only uh, caveat to that. And so feel free to think creatively and think outside the box a little bit. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing for just a moment. There we go. So I can set up these breakout rooms, which is very exciting. Um, and I will also share the Jamboard link in the chat now. Um, so this Jamboard also has the um, link to, or it has the prompt on it. So if you are in the Jamboard, you can have the prompt and it will be good to go. Um, Oh, they're all closed. Look at us. I guess the minute expires. Here we go. Hi, friends. Welcome back. Excited to have you all here. Um, we'll go through just a brief two minute like, like uh, description of what you came up with in your groups. Um, why don't we start with room number one, which I believe was Chris, Kaylin, and Nathan. Sure. Sounds good. Um, if Kaylin and Nathan, if you're good, I can talk through our 
<laughs> the color coding mess that is the, our Jamboard. Um, so yeah, we had some, uh, some ideas around this. Um, so some of them are in the green stickies up top, which are picking five items and like dragging and dropping them to a cart to possibly look at the amounts that those are. Um, on that second sticky in green, it says each thing has a price and obviously, um, and would have set amounts like a sticker amount, but then when students move them to their cart, they would see that taxes are being added on and things like that. So they would have to start kind of thinking about the budgeting aspect. Um, we would maybe think about talking about um, buying in bulk and that, that often can seem cheaper, but food can go bad. And so like what can be frozen, what can be saved for long-term, that sort of thing and best ways to store certain foods. And then edu educating on where to go for certain groceries um, as well as like where is, maybe it's more expensive. The reference was that SFU has a grocery store up on the mountain and that is more expensive because things gotta get up on the mountain. So some information like that. Uh, we'd probably have, and I'm going to reference the blue stickies now, uh, we would have some budgeting documents and the Q, maybe some QR codes that would be on different posters. And then there would also be QR codes to different recipes that students could make. Um, and the budgets on those specific posters would probably go with the recipe so that you could see kind of like how much each item would be. To the uh, pink sticky at the bottom, there would also probably be different posters around where students could find different recipes and different budget documents so that they could uh, learn different recipes and, and understand kind of how to purchase those items. And then to the orange stickies, um, we would look at getting maybe posters around residents championed by student staff and food services, um, food services, depending on the relationship and the uh, the technology available food services could maybe broadcast recipes and cooking videos uh, to help students get more involved in cooking. And then there could be interactive tools uh, that students could engage with online to help that budgeting and maybe dragging and dropping things to the card like was mentioned before. Awesome, those are all fantastic ideas. Love them. I love the idea of like an interactive card that people can use for budgeting, that's so cool. Um, very, very cool, love it. Um, all right, let's go to breakout room number two, which I believe is Andre, Ben, Jen, and Tess. Okay, um, I don't know if I have screen sharing permissions, do I? Oh, I do, I'm getting a thumbs up. I gave them to everyone. Oh, beautiful. Please do not sc abuse screen sharing everyone. Thank you so much. Can you see my beautiful, interesting, layout okay beautiful <laughs> um so for our idea um we had uh for on our bulletin board um we were going to have be doing a lot of research first on like what the average costs of groceries for students in our area was and then that's kind of like what the bulletin board would be decorated with um there was a really good um visual representation um I think it was, there was like a person like sitting on the floor and there was like how much groceries they had around them. And then that would be, there'd be like monopoly money associated with that to like showcase how much those like actually cost. Uh, the outside border of the board would also be de decorated with monopoly money. That was a very important part of our process and idea. Um, and there would, the vision for the actual program would be that there would be a set amount of um, money in this budget based on the research that we do to find out like how much groceries cost on average for like week per slash month. Um, and then we would physically give them like a flyer for a local grocery store so that they could build a budget off of the information in that flyer. And then they could also um, like actually use that information. Um, and then we would, there would be like QR, a couple different QR codes on the bulletin boards. One of them would include additional resources for um, budget planning, just like some helpful tips and tricks. The other one would be a QR code um, with a pre-populated Jamboard as an example for a grocery list. And so basically what they're trying to do is come up with a, a grocery list op based off of this flyer um, and to create like a menu and a meal plan for the rest. We could either do a day or a week, kind of like depending on how much we've previously talked about that for like an added level of difficulty, we could do like a week. Um, 
and then those those groups roommate groups potentially are trying to work together to make a menu for the week and then those ideas are submitted um, to like some sort of form whether that be like a jam collective jam board or like an excel spreadsheet or whatever and which is open to all participants so that they could see those ideas and become almost like a collective shopping list um, we had a couple ideas in terms of like an incentive. So it could either be like a random winner gets their um, grocery list selected, or alternatively, we could have like a um, guest panel of judges to collect or to connect resources from campus, whether that's like um, some sort of like health, health and wellness initiative. Uh, and they could be like a guest panel and they select the winner and then that winner gets their um, groceries like paid for for a week. Um, and I think that's everything that we had. I love it. That's awesome. I love the idea of shared grocery lists and like kind of communal grocery lists. It's like a community, it's like community engagement, but also make it food. I like it. That's great. <laughs> All right. And then my last group. So what we would decided to go with was uh, kind of like a poster series throughout the semester. And this would be like the base layout of every poster is providing like a um, two recipes that are like either very minimalistic in terms of ingredients. That way you're not having to like purchase too many things. And it's also very um, easy to follow along for anybody who doesn't have cooking experience or may have never cooked for themselves before. Um, and we'll list out the options for them. So like if they want to go to like a more inexpensive uh, grocery store, such as like Safeway, which would be relative to like Kroger or Publix or uh, Fred Meyer for anybody who might be on the East Coast versus West Coast. Um, and then also giving them kind of like other stores who might be more expensive, such as like Whole Foods or New Seasons, places where you would find more organic or uh, less processed ingredients and then also giving them the instructions down below. So that way it's all located within one place. They could take a quick picture of the poster and be like, oh, cool. I definitely want to go buy these things and like uh, follow along with this recipe. And then we also give them uh, coupons to it so they could just scan the QR code and it takes them to like the uh, grocery stores kind of like, you know, those books that they have at the, like usually at the entrances of uh, grocery stores well, a lot of them have been turning those digital for anybody who might want to like get them ahead of hand. And they can kind of go through and see like, oh, I can get this. Oh, they have these coupons for this. I can do that. Uh, and the reason we want to make this kind of like either a weekly or a bi-weekly shift out. So that way they're always getting new recipes throughout the semester to cook. They're also getting updated coupons and deals uh, from those stores that uh, fit the area. And so, yeah, that's what we decided to to kind of provide so that way it's always new and fresh every week or bi-weekly depending on the frequency that the person would want to do it at but it's also inexpensive easy to cook uh and giving resources to do it as well love the idea of the coupons that's so smart and just like having them have that resource that already exists in the world but like I don't know when was the last time anybody maybe I just am bad at coupons but when was the last time anybody else thought about coupons I like forgot they existed for a while there so <laughs> thank you good reminder uh thanks everyone that was really fun I think all of your ideas are so wonderful like good thoughts I hope this is a helpful thing to bring with you and maybe something that you can implement in your institution next year um or over the summer if you have summer students I think it's a great summer program talking about budgeting so uh, I hope this is helpful for you all and I hope you had a wonderful time um I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box here if you have any questions or want to connect or want my slides for any of this please feel free to reach out to me uh, always happy to connect and share all of that with you all. Um, but thank you so much for being an engaged and wonderful audience for my presentation today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Uh, just a big thank you to you, Mason, for leading today's webinar. Um, it was an excellent presentation. I really appreciate uh, all the opportunity to participate ourselves and then as well learning about UBC residences. Um, the passives that you're doing it that's awesome and it's great learning for everyone i think um and then just thank you to everyone who joined us today and participated that 
all you are all so great and we appreciate it so much. Um, don't forget to fill out the first Friday webinar evaluation, which I've pasted in the chat. And if you're interested in presenting yourself, the professional development uh, email is also there. Um, so you can email Becca and I there at that email. Um, otherwise, thank you again, everyone for coming. Thank you again to Mason and I hope everyone has a great weekend.